You mentioned boring. So all those who are wondering where Elias is, <laughs> I knew I got a, I got a, I got a subscriber comment that said Elias is boring, but we really like your show. So I fired Elias just for today. Uh, he'll be back with his next. And that time. wasn't a setup, Elias. No, it wasn't. That, that, you just kind of fed right into that. I don't that, think Jeff. Elias is boring. Uh, no. He just he maybe uh, anyway. We'll leave it at. This is Roger Abel. Welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. Today in the studio, I've got Jeff Johnston. Uh, I've been fortunate to know Jeff for, I don't know, I think we met in 2003, Jeff. I joined Premier Investments of Iowa, and uh, I'm happy to have you here. A little background on Jeff. He runs the, um, the Living Undeterred podcast and website. He authored a book called This One's For You, kind of motivated mm -hmm. by things that happened in your life. Um, he has 30 years of investment experience in this industry. And, and I thought today was interesting because a lot of the things that you talk about and you're a little bit passionate about, I feel like we're seeing in the investment world. And, and I want to talk about some of those things. And what riled my attention is um, you wrote a blog the other day, and it's called When Winning is Losing. And I read this blog, and I thought about it. I'm like, you're exactly right. And some of the patterns that you talk about are patterns that are happening today. So tell me a little bit about why you decided to write the blog when winning is losing and kind of the thesis behind that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to navigate through that. You know, and just what you're doing, the behind the wealth uh, mindset is what attracts me the most. I mean, 30 years of being in the investment business, um, you know, it gets a little mundane. Got a little bored about opening up IRA accounts for people and setting up balanced portfolios and things like that. I kind of like lost I lost the passion for what I was doing and then obviously went through a very traumatic life event, losing a child to heroin. And so it kind of forced me to go down the addiction and substance abuse road. And from that, I started reflecting back on my life and, and pulling back a lot of the, I won't say mistakes, I don't believe in making mistakes. They're only mistakes if you don't learn from them. So I go back in my life and I think about my gambling addiction, my alcoholism, things that I went through in my life and then losing a son to heroin and actually losing, losing a marriage. Um, in this in this time frame really opened me up to trying to focus on my well-being what what am i really trying to chase in my life what, what's the difference between happiness and peace and so i wrote this these blogs started um, becoming a way for me to almost therapeutically discuss some of the problems i was having and people looked at you know premier they maybe look at you look at me as achieving some type of success and you know success is really only relative to where we are in our lives and so being asked to come in your show, I thought I would spend some time, you know, going back and forth, navigating through some of these difficult uh, things that people, you know, question as they go on with their day. And um, you specifically brought up the "Win Winning Is Losing" blog that I wrote, and that particular blog came from my uh, desire to become, to continue becoming vulnerable. And part of healing any traumatic event is talking about it. So, behind the wealth. You're peeling back the curtain. You're talking about people's hopes and fears and dreams. And that's really what I like to do in, in my position in my life right now. So yeah, the blog was written out of my inspiration to continue being vulnerable and talk about uh, addiction and, and um, uh, people's relationship with money, specifically gambling. And I know when I talked to you about this before the show, your eyes lit up like, wow, that's let's talk about gambling and investing. Let's talk about the, what's happening with GameStop and Robinhood and all these things. And I said, oh, Stop talking, Roger. Let's save this for the show. <laughs> we actually had a better show going, going than we before did. the show. So I had to stop you from talking because you and I could just sit there and talk about this. So that's kind of where I'm at. Thanks for having me on the show. And, and uh, I think um, with that, we can just start going down certain roads and see where this goes. So one of the things that made me think about this blog specifically is what's going on today. And let's call it the trading community. Right. I'm tired of people calling this investing, but what's happening specifically with the Robinhood app and some of these popular names. And I went back and did some research and I was talking to you about how this Robinhood app works because you weren't really familiar. And I right. said, you know, what they've done is they've gamified yeah. investing or trading. And yep. and I said, you know, they shoot off rockets and, you know, confetti. And I, I did some research in the, yeah. when you make your first trade on Robinhood, it congratulates you by shooting confetti in the air. That's pathetic. Then I it, just, it, it so so you think about this, and I thought back to when games first got on phones, right? Mm -hmm. There was a game back. This is probably seven years ago. 
called Candy Crush. Mm -hmm. And And everybody was addicted to Candy Crush. And they had all these in-app purchases. And you could, oh, for 99 cents, you can upgrade for this. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, like, well, this is what they've done to the Robinhood app Mm -hmm. to make people feel like it's a game Mm -hmm. and it's gambling versus investments. And in your blog, there's there's a line in here um, that says, number one, you're never satisfied, but you are you are actually losing by winning. Right. Explain to me what you mean by when you're gambling, you can still win, but you're still losing. Yeah, and again, uh, throughout this journey of becoming vulnerable, I, 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 I can't say I like it, but I enjoy going back and, and criticizing myself, you know, talking about the problems I had. Now, I was warned by a lot of people, hey, Jeff, you're still a financial advisor, you still own a wealth management firm, you know, you're still out there taking on new clients. You know, I personally don't see clients anymore, but you do and everyone else does, and so, all the things we're doing are bringing in people. And they're like, Jeff, don't talk about compulsive gambling as an investment guy. And I'm like, well, this that's the stigma that I'm sick of. I'm sick of people saying, don't talk about being sexually molested. Don't talk about being an alcoholic. Don't talk about your drug use. You know, why? I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of anything. So I was a compulsive gambler in my 20s and 30s. And I was running a very successful investment business. I pulled it off successfully. Um, they, never, they never interfered with, with each other. But in talking about that, when winning is losing, what happened to me is about a decade of gambling, and and obviously I was not very successful at it. I actually sucked at it. Um, I finally realized, and I had a friend of mine one time, we came back from Las Vegas without any money. You know, we lost it all in Vegas. (laughs) We used to joke that there's a statue of us by the ATM machine, you know, putting our card in, trying to get money out of it. But anyway, so he said to me, Jeff, you know, I'm done with gambling. I said, well, every addict says that, every alcoholic says, that's my last drink, you know, it's, I've been down this road. He said, no, I'm done. I said, well, how'd you, how'd you trick your brain to quit gambling? And maybe there's some overlap here with investors that are turning into gamblers. He said, well, I finally realized that when I won, I lost. So winning was losing. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when you win a bet, it validates, it reinforces that that's an appropriate behavior. So you ultimately will bet again. Well, statistically, the casino knows this and Robin Hood knows this. Robin Hood knows this with all the f- things they're doing. They know the longer you stay, the, the more that, that they'll win. Um, again, I don't can't necessarily speak for Robin Hood specifically because I'm not certain on how they get paid. But with casinos, it's pretty easy. They get paid by you losing money. And more importantly, the difference between an investor and a gambler, Roger, and this would be probably the most valuable thing for anybody watching this. And th- there is a huge difference between an investor and a gambler. Um, is this is one word and it's time. That's the difference. That's the differentiator is time. An investor has none. A gambler has plenty. I'm sorry, the other way around. A gambler has none. An investor has plenty. So in other words, a gambler, everything's right now. I have to make up for the loss I just had. I have to, I have to win back things. And, and there's a game in 20 minutes. Everything's right now. For an investor though, yeah, you buy a property, you hold on to it for 20 years. You buy any stock and hold on it for 20 years. You buy any asset class, hold on it for a long period of time, you're probably gonna make money. And that's the difference. So now you go back to what you talked about, the balloons and the confetti. They're taking this lo- long-term approach that we all know that's how you make money in, in stocks, is long-term. And they're, they're putting it into a short-term visual presentation to more specifically the younger generation. Absolutely. You know, there's not a lot of Rogers and Jeffs online trading. It's the 20, 30, even teenagers now, and there's that one kid that killed himself. Yep. There was some alg- al- al- uh, algorithm or whatever on his account that said he had lost $700,000, which wasn't accurate, and he killed himself. So <clears throat> I, think, I think the moral of the story for me is, you go back to what I used to say a long time ago, Rogers, that the average investor held a mutual fund in the 60s, like 12 years. And today, it's less than 12 months. People are holding investments. So if anyone could show me the evidence that says that investors today are making a better rate of return than they did 30, 40 years ago, I'd be happy to change my conversation. But the fact is they aren't. They aren't. And no, you're right, because you you can go back and even look at Dalbar studies where Mm -hmm. they just compare holding an index to the average investor, and they're losing by 8% a year. Yeah, minimum. And it's because of the emotions that run investments, greed and fear, which, you know, people right now are... I mean, they're as greedy as they've ever been. They right. believe they can go put fifty dollars into something and turn it into a million. Right. And that's where I believe this gambler mentality 
is coming through. And you mentioned something. You said, you know, I'm not familiar with Robinhood and how they get paid. Yeah. Let me tell you how they get paid and tell the listeners. And then it's all going to start to make sense why they do it this way. Robinhood actually gets paid by sending order flow to large hedge funds like Citadel. Um, and they become the market maker. So they're getting paid to send all the order flow over here. So the more orders that are placed, what happens? the more money they actually get paid. Absolutely. So why wouldn't yeah. they want to make this app into a game and turn investing into literally just gambling? Most of these people don't even know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have a recommended tips for the day. So one of the things I want people to know is, you know, if you have kids, like my, my cousin Mike was on the show a week ago, Mike Graham, and he said, hey, my son's on Robin Hood doing this. And I said, that's cool, but Let's talk about why they're doing it. Is this entertainment or investing? And I think it's great people getting involved, but you need to be very cautious if your kids are doing this because bad things can happen and they may or may not know what they're doing. Um, just like gambling, you go to the casino, right? And, and I remember the first time I went to a casino, I went and I lost some money. I needed some more money. My buddy was there. I mean, I'm like 20 at the time. I think he goes, well, just go do a cash advance to your credit card. Yeah. Great I'm idea. like, I go, no, I, I looked at him. I said, what's that? He goes, right. well, you just put your credit card machine and like, it'll just give you money, right. give you cash and then you just pay it back. Oh yeah, let's do that. So I spent the money I had and now I went and borrowed more money, which is actually similar to what? Trading on margin. Right. You're borrowing money to make trades. I right. was borrowing money to gamble with. Now, fortunately, I happened to win on the biggest bet of the night and I walked away. Yeah, that's the worst thing that could happen. But I realized what this thing, credit was and what yeah. this credit card, and I, I feel like that's what all of these young people and people on this, this app are doing. They're trying to turn this into a video game. Could be a video yeah. game addiction, right? Maybe that's not oh, gambling, yeah. but it's an entertainment. There's a lot of parallels, yeah. Think about video games. I, I know kids that will sit down and play video games yeah. for eight hours. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's not normal. No, it's not. That's normal. an addiction. They're addicted right. to the screen time. Right. So I think a lot of the things you talk about with addiction and you know, investing, they're starting to overlap right. more than I've ever seen. Would you agree no, with I that? No, I do, I do. And you bring up the phone thing and I, I think to myself, you know, as a past compulsive gambler, um, I'm not saying that I don't go to casinos. I mean I I stay away from casinos. To me, um, all this is a continuum. It's a sliding scale. It's like, you know, you, I hate to use the, the analogy of autism, but they talk about a spectrum. Addictions and gambling are the same way. Alcoholism, all that's a spectrum. Um, to me, uh, with gambling, um, I figured out on that winning is losing mentality that I don't have to just never gamble again. I, I know now I have limits. And so I can go to a casino with a certain amount of money. I leave everything else at home. And when I'm out, I'm out. I go home. Or, and I've, I've also got myself to walk out of a casino with money, which was very hard for me to do because I, I walked in, I had two goals. I want to win all the money or I'm going to walk out with nothing. There was no middle ground. It was the, the extremes were just all or nothing. So now I come in there, I have fun, I enjoy it. I play nickel slots like I never used to do. So I still gamble, but I have it all within the context of me enjoying it. And looking at the phone, for example, my death nail would be if I opened up an online uh, uh, um, gambling account. If I opened up the ability to bet on football, basketball, that would be the absolute worst thing for me to do as a compulsive gambler is to have that ability to do that. So for me, I know my limits. And so people out there that are struggling with this and they're trading their stocks and confetti's going off, they're, they're bored with their own life. So this is their addiction is, is this instant visual gratification that they're buying and selling something. So for me, it's like, I'm not, we're not telling people not to do this. Just like I'm not telling people not to go to casinos, but have an objective, have a goal in mind. Just making money isn't a goal. We all have that. We all have the desire to make money. Like I told you earlier, eating food isn't a goal. We, we all have to eat. Well, we all have to make money. A goal needs to be specific to you. What, what is your objective? A goal would be, Roger, I want to make 12% after taxes and, and fees in the, in the year. That's a goal. Not, not trying to win and lose every single bet that you make, i.e. every stock that you buy. That, that's, that's a compulsion. And that, that's a problem with, with our society today. There's two things you said there that are important. One, you said you wanted to win all the money. Yeah. That's an infinite number. It is. It can never be accomplished. Right. And I didn't know that back in the day. Right. I so, was so competitive. Right. If you went to the casino and said, hey, <laughs> my goal is to enjoy my time with $100, right. wherever it takes me, it takes me. Right. Okay, fine. Right. A second thing you said was 
you know, if your goal is to make 12% after taxes, et cetera, et cetera, I still don't think that's a goal because it didn't quantify where you want to go. So if you think about kind of the onus of the entire show we do, it's revolving around someone financially putting their priorities together and figuring out where they want to go right. because you can never get there if you don't know. Right. So we talked to everybody about having a well-written financial plan because mm -hmm. 12%, well, I don't know if that's the number you need or not. You wrote, um, what I call like a guide, yeah. I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 yeah. years ago, yeah, at least. called the retirement survival yeah. guide. And one of the things in the guide that you've talked about for ages is having a fair rate of return. Yep. And people that are trading on Robinhood or people who think that's investing, it's not, it's right. gambling. Right. Because you haven't established right. what your fair rate of return is. And that fair rate of return is 100% based upon your goal. Absolutely. So, yep. I, Talk to me about the fair rate of return, how you came up with that idea, because I think people today should be more focused on that versus the greed of, hey, I only made 12% last year and this growth fund made 36. Why don't I have more of that? Because I've actually heard that right. more in the last six months because people, you know, if you look at like a growth index last right. year, it was through the moon, right. but the S&P 500 did 14, 15%. Why didn't I own more of that? Talk to us about the fair rate of return goal, how you came up with that simple idea yeah. that really works for everybody. And it's interesting because that fair rate of return goal is now um, talked about in the context of imposter syndrome. So people will look at somebody else and say, I'm inferior to, say, say Roger. Roger's got a successful podcast. He's a successful financial advisor. He bought a beautiful place down at the Lake of the Ozarks. I'm, I'm jealous of Roger, now I have imposter syndrome. Well, we do that with our investing. We, we go online and we see somebody post that they made 100% on some stock or they bought Tesla, now they're up 700 or, and they start comparing themselves to other people. And that is just a, that's a, that's a road to go down that has no positive ending as far as I'm concerned. So the whole concept of imposter syndrome does kind of trickle over to some of these things we talk about with people comparing themselves. So the example you're talking about where I would say is, is the average person out there that says, the in the s p did 45 percent who cares i mean who why why do you care what the s p does why do you care that roger has has, has success in his practice why do you care that that's a inferior inferior complex you have about yourself so the only rate of return you should ever compare yourself is your fair rate of return goal so what i wrote about a long time ago before the imposter syndrome is even a household word was you know, you get up in the morning, you get up in the morning, you look at the end of the year, you look at your rate of return that you made. And let's say it's it's 10. And there's two things you have to think about. A, well, first of all, you don't want to think about what the S&P did because it'll probably depress you. More likely it did better than what you did. But if your goal was only seven and you did 10, man, you, you did great. You ought to call your financial advisor up and, and, and say, hey, you know what? Great job, Roger. I, my goal was seven and I did 10. I don't give a crap the S&P did 45. Well, what relevance is that to me if I outperformed my goal? And that is the mindset I'm trying to get people when they look at their money is to stop comparing themselves to some arbitrary number like the S&P 500 or what Elon Musk did or what Bitcoin's doing. It's, it's so insignificant and irrelevant and such a distraction to what you're trying to achieve. And ultimately, what are we really trying to achieve, Roger? We're trying to achieve peace of mind and, and a better well-being in our life, you know, better well-being in our lives. You're not doing that by comparing yourself to other people. That's just, that's just not, it's not, a, it's not a healthy way to live your life in any context. Just made me think about something. We both read Dr. Crosby's book, oh, yeah. Laws of Wealth. And he, he said in there, and this really hit just a second ago, I'm like, well, this is perfect. He talks about in that book that um, diversification is actually admitting defeat. Right. Absolutely. Be because yeah, if you're diversified, way. you're you're not going to beat the S&P 500 right. on a regular basis right. if you're diversified. Right? right. Because diversification enhances <laughs> returns, but lowers overall risk. Right. And this Which is, is what we want to do. Right. And, and he <laughs> talks about that. It, that section particularly, he talks about how there has been great wealth built by highly concentrated stock positions. Right. Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, yeah. Jeff Bezos. But most people will never, ever, ever experience that. So they're better off having a very well diversified portfolio, admitting that they're not going to be able right. to outthink this. Um, and that made me think about what you just said. If you, if the S and P 500, if you're always comparing yourself to that, it's a fool's game. You're You'll not going to win. win. Well, You'll just buy, the, just buy the S and P 500, do it yourself. Th yeah. Then stop comparing because right? you right. own it. Right. right. Like don't, don't, well, do you want to do an about. index, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that, that really made me think about 
that. I thought that was um, a good takeaway. Well, something I wanted to throw in there, Roger, is, you know, again, going back to Dr. Crosby, because I absolutely think he's he's on the forefront of a lot of this stuff. And um, I really, really enjoy, uh, I follow him on Twitter and, and all these other. I think a lot of what we do in our business, we we gravitate towards that because we oh, yeah. believe in it. Yeah. I think everybody in our office says, hey, there's validity to this to really mentally help coach people. We talk of the psychology of all this stuff, but there's also a physiology involved. And this is where I would caught Dr. Crosby on a podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about that the the we're hardwired as human beings to be defensive. You know, we're, we're taught to flee when we hear something in, in the brush, you know, many millennia ago. We would run thinking it was a lion. Well, it could have been the wind. You know, we're just, we're, we're preconditioned to to have a, like a fear response. Well, physio- the physiology with fear, if you think about it, and I wrote some of these things down, that's why I'm kind of looking over here, is that Dr. Crosby said you lose 13% of your cognitive processing power during a fear episode. So go back to stocks. You know, you, you own a stock and you click on your portfolio or you click on your you know, which people now used to be like once a day. Now it's like 50 times a day, which is insane. But that's what they do because they can. Um, but think if you know for a fact that you lose 13% of your cognitive processing power in, in the midst of fear and you look at your stock and you hear all these things being thrown at you through all the sources you follow and they're just they're fear mongering. They're just perpetuating this, you know, get out, get out, get out. And if you know you're going to lose 13% of your, your cognitive thinking abilities, then maybe you ought not look at these things as frequently. You're just setting yourself up for disappointment. Um, I think I heard someone once say that any investment you make, not just a stock, has three things happening at all times. It goes up, stays the same, or go down. Well, two of those threes suck. <laughs> no one wants to stay <laughs> no the same and no one wants those. to go down. So right. you know one out of three is the only way you're going to be happy. So why do you look at this stuff all the time? Someone tell me, what emotional well-being enhancement are you having by looking at your investments on a monthly basis? So what, what, other than the simple fact of self-torture, you like to torture yourself, um, or just pure greed or stupidity, what, what benefit is there to look at your investments on a regular basis? There's there not. is none, Th- especially if you're 50 there's or 40 a, or 30. There's only one benefit, and that's to make sure you haven't been defrauded. Or you're bored. You're, right, you're yeah. bored. And you, I think we've seen that. Right. Some of the stuff we're talking about a year ago, so... We weren't talking about any of this. Right. And I have this theory of why people have become addicted to trading or the Robinhood app. And and I may or may not be wrong, but a year ago, if you wanted to go, you were a gambler and you wanted to bet on a baseball game or you mm-hmm. wanted to bet on a football game or you mm-hmm. wanted to bet on basketball, mm-hmm. you could just go do it. Right. You could go to Vegas and do your bet. Right. Well, all that stopped when coronavirus happened. Right. And where does the professional gambler go yeah. if they can't make a bet. Their phone. Their phone, because now, oh wait, they, I can- They can stay in their bed and bet on games. I can go to, well now, I can just go to the stock market and right. I can bet around the clock yeah, so all you can bet that on two I things, want. Sports and stocks. Right, but yeah. a year ago they couldn't. Right. So I think it's what kind of opened this Pandora's box right. as to, hey, let's go see what we can do in the stock market. And if, I, if memory serves me correct, they went through something similar to this in China. I don't know if it was like 15 years ago. Right. Where everybody thought they were day traders. And we saw this 20 years oh, yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. 20 the years ago. teachers quitting their jobs, trading stocks. And it was fun till it wasn't. I remember when we started working together in 2003. And back then it was day traders. We won't have a job because of day traders. Right. Well, how fast did they go out? I mean. The first correction. To be honest with you, I have heard nothing about, you know, professional day trading. I know people no. have done it. Right. People have been doing it. There's some, right. you know what, what 80, 89% of people don't make money day trading. So there's a percentage. Well, that they do. don't even factor in the taxes and the trading costs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But it was gone. Right. It was completely gone mm-hmm. until about April of last year. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden there's this day trading craze. And it starts me starts to make me think about a couple of things. John Templeton's famous quote, all bull markets end in euphoria. So one, do you think we're at this euphoric state? And we don't predict markets, but when things like GameStop and these companies that are just trading at outlandish multiples start to happen, I don't know how that is sustainable long-term. And then Warren Buffett, he has a second greatest saying, be fearful when others are greedy. And right now I just feel like we're at this height of greed with everything we do in life. I, I remember a, 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 a book I was reading by uh, Rick Edelman, uh, who wrote a book. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but the context was- you The know, truth of money. It could be. You know at the top of a market when the construction guy roofing your house starts giving you stock tips. 
And that's when you know it's at top of a market. When everybody has a stock tip out there, you know that's, and that is true. When I look at the last two, 01 and 08, the last two really big pullbacks we had, boy, you could throw darts and everybody was an expert, everybody. I mean, locally we had McLeod stock that was that untouchable, st I mean, you, yeah. you couldn't lose money on it until you did. And then it was people that were just over allocated and got, got, got literally killed, um, wiped out. Um, so can we learn from these lessons? When, is, when will human beings start to learn from these lessons? And the problem is, is that, especially the younger generations, is that they, have, they lack the one thing that they need to have, is that's patience. I mean, most, uh, most people that have done well in investing have some uh, core element of patience. And um, I think the ability to look at your investments frequently has done more damage than any other thing out there. Uh, in regards to investors achieving a fair rate of return and hitting their retirement goals and trying to um, stay away from becoming a gambler. And again, I, this is coming from a gambler. And uh, I, I, you know, I can say, ironically, I never gambled with stocks. I mean, I, I gambled with money that I didn't respect. I didn't really um, have a, an emotional attachment to, which is hard to explain for someone who's not a compulsive gambler. My stocks, I've never gambled with. I, I don't, I, I've never got into the habit of buying stocks and selling them. Matter of fact, I, full disclosure, I, I probably, in the course of a year, maybe sell one stock in my whole portfolio. Yeah. I probably sell one stock, and that's probably just to do some tax uh, strategies. I buy, I buy and buy and buy. And I, I, from my investment philosophy, I have been able to separate my gambling life back in the day and my investment life. I never got lured into the, um, the attraction of buying and selling stocks on a regular basis. You think as an investment guy, as a compulsive gambler, I, I was probably doing that. I, I never crossed that, that road. And maybe because I was a fearful, it would start to permeate into my business. So I was fortunate enough, as I say, I was a functional alcoholic as well. I could drink a lot and still come to work and you know, never got in trouble with that. My gambling was the same way. I found ways to separate, but a lot of people can't do that, Roger. They most get into people, gambling, most people can't they start that. stealing from their business, they start stealing from their spouse, and all of a sudden it, it, it permeates into their whole life. And for some odd reason, I guess I was uh, dumb enough that I didn't let that uh, get into my life. So when winning is losing is a great mindset when you are thinking about whether you want to get into being a trader in stocks or a gambler. Ask yourself, if you do buy that stock and it goes up you know, 300%, um, what are you going to do? You got to be right twice, right? You got to yeah. sell it and then you got to turn around and buy something and be right again. So it gets very difficult to always be right with timing for investing. Hey, Jeff, one of the things when you were coming by my office and we were talking about what we were going to do for a show today, you talked about this theory of what's called the PERMA model of happiness. And we didn't discuss it. So I don't even know what this is, but right. talk to me about why you think this is relevant regarding how people invest and what, what the overlap is and maybe just the background of this, this PERMA model of happiness. Yeah. When I wrote my book, um, uh, this one's for you, an inspirational journey through addiction, death, and meaning, uh, essentially to honor my son who died from a heroin overdose and also try to find inspiration and ways to move on. I reached out to Dr. Daniel Crosby, which we've talked about plenty of times on the show. And in interviewing from him for my book, he said, Jeff, you ought to look at something called the PERMA model. And I thought, okay, wrote it down, PERMA model, didn't think much about it. And then I saw him on a podcast uh, a week ago and he brought it up again. So I went back and, and researched it more in depth. And it's uh, an idea, uh, essentially, the, the, um, by Martin Seligman, who came up with this um, mindset of positive psychology. And so when I started peeling back the layers of how this worked, I started seeing so much overlap to the investment business in that when we meet with clients every day, we're almost more psychologists than we are stock pickers, wouldn't you say? I mean, I, 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 mean, I agree 100%. Yeah, and so, and so part of what we try to do with people is dig deep to find out their relationship with money. Is it dysfunctional? Is it unhealthy? Or do they have a, a good relationship with money and, and fair rates of returns and things like that? So again, not knowing this off the top of my head, I'm gonna jump over to my notes here, but the PERMA model, the P-E-R-M-A, stands for this. And again, it's uh, Martin Seligman is the um, the author of this ideology, um, positive experiences or positive emotions. So trying to find more fun in your life, obviously having an optimistic attitude towards anything is, is better than being negative. Again, it's a continuum. You don't want to be overly optimistic where you're just naive and you don't want to be just overly negative where it's destructive. So there's a, there's a continuum there. The second one is engagement, find deep work. Well, 
in, in right now in my life, my engagement is this living undeterred mindset that I've kind of stumbled into through all this uh, research I've been doing after our son died. And now that is where my passion is. Not that I don't love premier investments and doing the investment business, but I've, I've almost like got two things now I'm very passionate about, which is that's okay. Very that happens out. to people. So I've got deep work and deep deep meaning. And you're at you know you're at a stage in your career where I was you know 15 years ago where you're very deep and uh, a meaning into your into your job right now with Premier and now doing the podcast and stuff. So you found you found meaning. Um, relationships, c- connectivity. Uh, that is the key to everything. Having good healthy uh, relationships, setting boundaries with people, um, eliminating toxic people. I call them emotional vampires. People are always bringing you down. It's no different than the negative client, Roger. You and I have had experiences. We met with people where they met them the first time and the first words out of their mouth was, I hate my lawyer, I hate my CPA, I hate my accountant. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be on that list They're going to hate you next. I'm going to be on that (laughs) list. If you hate everyone around you, then why would I want to work with you? You're just going to hate me eventually. So you want to get those people out of your life. It's very non-productive. The last two would be meaning, finding something bigger than yourself. And that's kind of similar to engagement. Engagement is more of the deep work that you're doing. Meaning is kind of more of a bigger picture. So what is your ultimate goal? Well, your family. I mean, that, that would be your meaning. Your parents, your, 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 your siblings, um, people that you're trying to add value to those relationships and not detract from. And then advancement. How far have you come? You know, I mean, in our business, we track our AUM. We track our number of new, new clients that have joined the company. We track our marketing. So you have to have some, some scale where you're measuring yourself, not against your peers, but measuring things against yourself. Um, you know, kind of wrap this up in a bow tie. I always tell my, my two boys, Roman and Ian, you know, at the end of the day, when you go to bed, look in the mirror and ask the person that is looking back at you, what have you done today? What, where have, where have the, all these things, positive engagement, relationships, meaning, and advancement, where's all that come from to the person that you're looking at in the mirror? Because that's all that really matters at the end of the day. No, no one else matters. And I think that mindset for me, losing a child and marriage and these other things that have happened to me uh, have made me realize how, how really special that we have right now. The moments we have each day is you know, a gift. It sounds corny, but that's really what it is. It's a gift. And so I get really frustrated when I hear all these things going on with the uh, distractions people are having with the gambling and the trading and, and the, you know, the dissatisfaction people are having with their lives right now. It's, it's Something that makes sad. me think about is we used to teach a class, or we still do, called Rejuvenate Your Retirement at yeah. the local community college. And one of the first sections in that class is non-financial. Right. And, and when and maybe we're doing a poor job, but the first thing we talk about with people are how much do you need to live on, right. all the financial money, money, stuff. Money. And yeah. that almost makes me think about what if we tried, and maybe I'll do this in my practice, but what if we kind of shifted this and had people focus on these five non-financial things first? What kind of, first, right. what kind of results would that actually drive through the financial planning process? Because what we talk a lot about on this show is developing the financial plan. Mm-hmm. And maybe one of the things we're lacking in that, and I'm just talking out loud, is it's all financial. And there is a very non-financial part, non-financial part of retirement. Mm-hmm. Think about it. how many people have you had that have retired and all of a sudden, how they thought things were going to go is not how they went in retirement because Most of the time. they didn't have this non-financial part figured out. They retired and said, oh, this is going to be great. Right. I'm going to golf every day. Right. But they forgot that they lived in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had the part-time job working somewhere right. because they got bored and they just didn't really, and maybe it wasn't that they didn't think it out, but they just didn't think it out. They didn't right. say, hey, what am I going to do? What's What's my engagement going to be? What's my meaning? What are, what are all these different things? So that's something we need to do a better job well, of. Well, we do. And I think I think the it's a, two, it's a two-way street. I think advisors need to set the narrative when people first come in, you know, disarm them and get away from the financial mundane stuff, GameStop and Robin and all these things that just are distractions and get into the more, you know, deeper level meanings about the relationships. And then the consumers, the people coming in, need to get these stigmas away that we're stock pickers and that we're, we're, we're geniuses at, 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 you know, selecting these things that never lose money. People don't understand that, you know, part of investing is losing money. And, and in 31 years, believe it or not, I've not put clients in investments that always went up. I mean, we've had investments that have done poorly. I wish we did. And people don't understand that. So when they have 10 investments with us and one's a nightmare, one sucks and eight did well, they're going to spend all their time on the one that was a nightmare and lose focus of all the other good right. stuff that went on. So I think I think it's it's a I think we both need to get better at it. We as advisors and definitely consumers have to come in here a lot more 
um, willing to um, break down their own biases that they had, thinking what we do isn't what we do. You know, we're, when's the last time you sat with a client and spun the wheel and throw darts at picking stocks? You know, and that's kind of what they think we do. It actually makes me think about one of the things I discussed with Mike Grimm last week, and we talked about information flow, and you'll appreciate this. And I said, 20 years ago when he did Money on Mondays. Yeah. Well, that was, that was Mike. Mike did Money I, on I Mondays. I know Mike is. I, I forgot that. So that was kind yeah. of the onus of the show is what happened back then. But Mike's also a sportscaster. Right. So he's most well-known. He's the voice with of the, the Gophers. Gophers. Yep. Yep. Um, and he, he was here with uh, University of Iowa. He was on WMT, and he worked for the Cardinals organization. But when he was doing this, I said, Mike, tell me 20 years ago what it was like in sportscasting. And he said, well, I pull the newspaper out. I get the scores, and we kind of recap the scores. Right. And I said, okay, tell me what it's like today. Right. And he said, well, today everybody already knows the scores, so now it's more of a storytelling because information yeah. flow is so much faster. It's the same thing in our world. 20 years ago, someone had to wait to open the paper right. to get the information of what the stock did the previous day because the Internet wasn't really mainstream. Or your, your 401k account mailed you every quarter you know, right. 40 years ago. Right. Now yeah. the information flow is so quick yep. that how we work with people has to change. Right. Because they have... When they come in here, we used to do reviews. Ten years ago, they come in, they eh, maybe, maybe didn't know how well they done. Now, right. they know because they checked their account before they came in. Right. So where's the meaning in what we're doing for people? It's in the planning. Yep. It's in this the other, all the non-financial stuff because they can see how well they're doing yeah. every single day. So it just makes you think about the flow of information, how much it's changed in 20 years, and then where it's going to go. I think it was Warren Buffett or somebody said, if your investments are exciting, you're probably not making money. And if you think about that, the, the more boring you can get your portfolio to be, you may underperform the averages, but that's probably what you want to do. Why, why would you want to overperform the averages on the upside? Because you're going to overperform on the downside. Yep. So again, it's mitigating risk. And it's, it's at the end of the day, when your head hits the pillow and you close your eyes, if your brain is spinning about all these things that you should have done with your investments, you need to rewire your brain because your dysfunctional relationship with money is going to be your downfall. If you can hit your bed on the, your head pillow on the bed and you close your eyes and you sleep well, then whatever you're doing is working. So right. you and I can talk about all these things and we can try to direct people to have better lives. But at the end of the day, it's really a personal choice people have to make. I know for me, I can't have an online stock brokerage account. I can't do it. I would be way too tempted to be trading all the time. I can't have I mean, on my phone. Well, especially if you I do have pos- online on, on computer, but... Um, the gambling, to me, I can't have an online gambling account. But it then think if they downfall. gave you the positive feedback. Oh, man, great trade. Uh, confetti. Like you just get ingrained. Yeah. But, you know, I think the great thing about this show is we don't concentrate on day trading. We're trying to tell people why it's not relevant. Right. It's not relevant because if you do the, the core philosophy of what we talk about, which is a well-written financial plan, establish a fair rate of right. return goal, and eliminate the media from your life, will all be significantly better off. It made me think of something to finish the, the show. I know we're kind of close to the time crunch here. Um, a while back, I got an email, and you've been a great uh, part of the radio show that we've been doing now for 11 years. You and I and Jonas and Gary Spiker started it with us a long time ago. I got an email uh, a while back, about a year ago. A guy emailed me, and he said, you know, Jeff, I, uh, I, I like your radio show and so forth, but it's, uh, it's too boring for me. It's, it's, I expected you guys to be giving recommendations, you know, stock picks and stuff like that. And I think I responded and said, thank you for the compliment. (laughs) Because for me, that was like, all right, I am doing the right thing. This one person tells me that my radio show is too boring. That's exactly what I want to hear. That reinforces that I'm doing the right thing because that person has a very unhealthy relationship probably with money. We want a boring radio show. Now, I don't think it's boring. He meant boring as in we're not telling people to go buy stocks and, and you know, right. people call in and we get on a computer and, oh, the multiples are – we've never done that. We never will. Our show is more about trying to get people to have a, a, a positive, well-being life, you know, increase their well-being, and have a healthy relationship with money. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to inspire. Yeah, well, I, th- I think that's a really good way to end. And you mentioned boring, so all those who are wondering where Elias is, <laughs> I knew I got a, I got a, I got a subscriber comment that said Elias is boring, but we really like your show. So I fired Elias just for today. Uh, he'll be back with his next. And that time. wasn't a setup, Elias. No, it wasn't. That, that, <laughs> you just kind of fed right into that. I don't think Elias is boring. Uh, no. He just he maybe uh, anyway. We'll leave it at that. Actually, he compliments me well <laughs> he does a great job. because he levels me out because yep. we're we're a little bit more on the excitable 
kind of part. There's but, a yin and yang with you two that works yeah, really well on the air. So. You're right. Well, um, if anybody out there wants help getting a financial plan, go to btwellshow.com. If you're interested in anything that Jeff's doing, what, what's your... It's uh, Living Undeterred. So it's www.livingundeterred.com. I have a weekly blog every Wednesday, and now I've been doing podcasts. I'm on my seventh podcast, and those post every Friday. And the podcasts are just, I'm meeting unbelievable human beings that have survived trauma, tragedy, uh, redirected their life, um, found new meaning, uh, people that make my story look, uh, you know, I, I'm inspired by these people. And so I really encourage people if they want a little, a little extra addition to Beyond the Wealth, go to livingundeterred.com and there's a whole bunch of nice compatible stuff there. Yeah, I think there's a huge overlap between what you're talking about and investing. And the more we kind of understand how the human brain works with mm -hmm. investing, the better most people will be. So with that said, appreciate everybody listening. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Until next time btwellshow.com.